Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and special guests. Welcome to Hartford Public High School, the second oldest high school in the nation, home of the L law and government, nursing, and green tech engineering. Uh, Green Tech Engineering and Technology Academy. I'm sorry, I'm kind of sick. Today we will be hosting our annual band book readout with our community partners, the Hartford Public Library and the ACLU. We're happy to have you here with us. Uh, enjoy your evening. I'm sorry. Thank you, Shakira. And good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Frieder, uh, Director of Community Development at Hartford Public Library. Can you hear me? Okay, good. It's my pleasure to add my welcome to Shakira's to this Band Books Readout. Um, Band Books Week is an annual event begun in 1982, celebrating the freedom to read and highlighting the value of free and open access to information, a principle to which the Law and Government Academy the American Civil Liberties Union of Connecticut, and Hartford Public Library are highly committed. And obviously you are too, or you wouldn't be here. Um, by focusing on efforts across the country to remove or restrict access to books, Banned Books Week draws national attention to the harms of censorship. The books featured in tonight's uh, readout have all been targeted with removal or restrictions in libraries or schools, or in the case of a very recent example right here in Connecticut, in prisons. Even though some of these books may seem rather tame to you, at one time or another someone found them so objectionable that they took action to prevent others from reading them. There's some info about each book uh, and why it was banned or challenged in the printed program that you received when you came in. And if you didn't receive it, there are more copies on the table over here. So you can take a peek at the insert there and you'll get a little more information about the books we're featuring tonight and why they were uh, challenged or, bans, or banned. Um, while books have been and continue to be banned, part of the Banned Books Week celebration is the fact that in a majority of cases, the books have remained available. This happens only thanks to the efforts of community members, librarians, teachers, and students who stand up and speak out for the freedom to read and the freedom to choose or express one's opinions, even if those opinions might be considered unorthodox or unpopular. So thank you for joining us tonight in support of the freedom to seek and express ideas and of ensuring the availability of those viewpoints to all who wish to read them. We're fortunate tonight to have a terrific moderator and a great panel of guest readers, and we'll meet them in just a minute. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our partner in this Band Books readout, Andrew Schneider, the Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Connecticut. Andrew? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And uh, it's great to be here to join you tonight to mark Banned Books Week, the celebration of the freedom to read. And once again, we're very pleased to be uh, sponsoring this event with the Hartford Public Library and the Law and Government Academy. Protecting the right to read is not just a matter of fighting outright government bans on books, but also it's about protecting the privacy of authors and readers. Here in Connecticut, we fought and defeated an attempt to force librarians to turn over patrons' library records under the Patriot Act and to impose a gag order to prevent the librarians from talking about it. But the challenges continue as we learn that the National Security Agency tracks internet activity that can also reveal what people read on websites. And, and through online uh, book buying and, and lending. And so we need to continue our vigilance against censorship in all its forms, including the chilling effect of surveillance on readers and the potential damage to our democracy. Tonight, we have a familiar voice to moderate this discussion. And for the second year in a row, I want to welcome John Dankowski. He's the news director of WNPR Radio and host of the popular program, Where We Live. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, folks. And, and what, what we're going to do, if any of you were here last year, you sort of get a sense of how we're going to do this, but we have an all-star panel of readers, and we want to hear from them. Uh, after each reading, I'll maybe engage them in a brief conversation, and then afterward, we can have a, a broader conversation, perhaps, of, about some of the themes that we've explored. And you can, of course, ask questions as well. Now, last year, I told a personal story to start this off about my introduction at a very early age to, to Kurt Vonnegut. I'm not going to go back so far right now. I'm going to go just to the news. And, and the news is, is interesting. I read it every day, of course. And I, I read this, that Randolph County, North Carolina, is, is reconsidering a ban on Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, a novel that focuses on black identity in the first half of the 20th century. Had any of you seen this story in the last few days? Um, in a 5-2 vote this week, the Randolph County Board of Education banned the book from county school libraries after the mother of an 11th grader complained. The mother claimed Ellison's work was inappropriate for summer reading, citing both language and subject matter. Now, of course, the Library of Congress had called Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man one of the books that shaped America. So this is clearly a, an important piece of literature. Um, what's interesting about this, and I think you'll hear a bit more about this when we hear from Wally Lamb in a few minutes, is that Almost immediately, there was a public outcry. And this public outcry went to the traditional media and now the social media. And when the Randolph County uh, Board of Education decided to reconsider this was after they heard that this story was being picked up by Russian television stations. That indeed the world was talking about their decision in a small community in North Carolina. And they've begun to reconsider. So you can indeed by actually talking about these things and talking them through in your local communities make, make a difference. So this is in the news today, and we'll hear uh, some more about some things that are recently in the news in Connecticut. I'd like to welcome our first reader, someone who is a, a friend of mine and a friend of our program where we live. Tom Condon is deputy editorial page editor for the Hartford Current, and he's here to read from a book that is a favorite of mine, George Orwell's 1984. Tom? Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide this microphone over here so that you can Okay. You can pass the microphone down as you go. So okay. Okay. Thanks. Can everyone? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> now they can. Can, hear me. can everyone hear me? Good. 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 It's it's only a coincidence that I'm, that I'm on the far right up here. Uh, um, be, before I start, I, I just want to urge on the the uh, students who are here um, and learning to write. Um, to please read George Orwell. Uh, he, uh, George Orwell is one of the clearest, most lucid writers that the English language has ever produced. And as you know, as you learn your own style, please, uh, please, please, please read George Orwell. Uh, I'm going to read um, a, a passage, a, a longish one, then a short one, from the first part of 1984, just to set the stage. Uh, for the, 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 I mean, this is the book that put the dis in dystopian. Um, <laughs> the, um, so the kind of, this is the kind of um, world that Orwell has envisioned. He, he wrote the book in 1948 and he flipped the numbers around and this is the world he envisioned in 1984. Um, and, and interestingly, it has been invoked in the last week with the uh, last two weeks with the revelations about NSA surveillance uh, an editor of The Guardian, um, English newspaper, said that it, uh, the NSA surveillance went beyond Orwell's imagination. Um, so uh, his ideas uh, about totalitarianism and the dangers of censorship remain completely relevant. So um, with that, I'll start outside. Even though the shut window, even though the shut window pane, the world looked cold. Down in the street, little eddies of wind were whirling dust and torn paper into spirals. And though the sun was shining and the sky a harsh blue, there seemed to be no color in anything except the posters that were plastered everywhere. The black mustachioed face gazed down from every commanding corner. There was one on the house front immediately opposite. Big Brother is watching you, the caption said, while the dark eyes looked deep into Winston's own. Down at street level, another poster, torn in one corner, flapped fitfully in the wind, alternately covering and uncovering the single word, Ingsoc. In the far distance, a helicopter skimmed down between the, between the roofs, hovering for an instant like a blue bottle and darting away again with a curving flight. 
It was the police patrol snooping into people's windows. The patrols did not matter, however. Only the thought police mattered. Behind Winston's back, the voice on the, from the telescreen was still babbling away about pig iron and the overfulfillment of the ninth three-year plan. The telescreen received and transmitted simultaneously. Any sound that Winston made above the level of a very low whisper would be picked up by it. Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision which the metal plaque commanded, he could be seen as well as heard. There was, of course, no way of knowing whether you were being watched at any given moment. Does that sound familiar? Um, how often or on what system the thought police plugged in or any individual wire was guesswork. It was even conceivable that they watched everybody all the time. But at any rate, they could plug in, plug in your wire whenever they wanted to. You had to live, did live, from habit that became in, instinct, from habit that became instinct, in the assumption that every sound you made was overheard, and except in darkness, every, moment, every movement scrutinized. Now at this point, he begins to look out at what was then the city of London, and comes to this observation. The ministry of truth, Minitru and Newspeak, was startlingly different from any other object in sight. There was an enormous pyramid, it was an enormous pyramid structure, pyramidal structure, of glittering white concrete soaring up, terrace after terrace, 300 meters into the air. From where Winston stood, it was just possible to read, picked out on its white face in elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Wow. <laughs> yes. um, Orwell was a journalist. Oh, sure, absolutely. And I think, I think many people who know this work and maybe a few of his other works do not know that. Talk about how you think that maybe informed the work that he, he did in this. Well, this he is a, he's a, a marvelous journalist um, and, uh, and a novelist. And very few people can do both at the level that, that, that he did. Uh, his, um, uh, his work on the Spanish Civil War, uh, Homage to Catalonia, is an absolute classic, um, written in a hospital where, where he was recovering from a bullet wound in the neck. Um, and, and it is amazing. Uh, there's so few people who can write, you know, journalism is often considered the first draft of history. <laughs> A handful of people can make it the final draft, <laughs> and uh, Frederick Lewis Allen was one. In uh, only yesterday, his story of the twenties. Orwell may, may be the uh, uh, you know may, maybe the archetype of um, able uh, someone able to do that. And his book on uh, oops, um, in his book on the sordid conditions in uh, coal mines, Road to Wigan Pier, his book of Down and Out in Paris and London, the hideous conditions in the, in the basements of restaurants. I mean, he was a muckraker. He was a political theorist. Um, it's interestingly, in 1984, um, his publisher issued a four-volume set of his letters, journalism, um, and, uh, and essays, and it really is a wonderful uh, investment in time. So, uh, and and, in, and of course, you know, watching watching what happened in, in you know, he was a socialist, but he but he was afraid of he was afraid of what he was seeing in Russia. He saw the he, he, he witnessed the World War II and Hitler's attack on England first uh, firsthand, and the references in 1984 to bombs hitting and everything that was that was very much in the mind of of his readers. So, I mean, his journalism, uh, uh, you know, certainly um, impacted his fiction. Uh, uh, one last thing for you, Tom, and I think that this is really important to consider now. Um, his name has become has become an adjective. It, this idea that something is Orwellian <laughs> is is often misappropriated these days uh, in some fairly disastrous ways. But even in the mainstream media, we see this all the time. It, it's come to mean something different than I think it was it was meant to mean, and it's all it, based uh, on this book. It, right? Yeah. I mean, I think if Orwell were here, he'd be appalled that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's misused almost as you know, almost as badly as Nazi is misused and a, a bunch Socialism, of other things. So, so yeah, yeah. I, no, I mean he 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 was uh, he was concerned about uh, about the effects of censorship and totalitarianism, changing the language, 
you know, eliminating history, all of, all of which he imagined as possible. And uh, that is Orwellian. You know, some political debate uh, is not. So I don't know. I, I'm still on the clock at work, so let me just check this out. <laughs> it's Big Brother watching Tom. Um, uh, well, um, isn't it? <laughs> it it, it really is. You needed a, uh, yeah. well, well, I mean, re really, I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, the telescreen that can, see, that can has a two-way, now he imagines that in 1948. I mean, he, he may have just gotten a year wrong. It's, it's, it's very, very close. Uh, perhaps you can pass the microphone next door to your neighbor, Rebecca Duncan, who's a student at the Law and Government Academy here, who's going to read from Walter Dean Meyer's Fallen Angels. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Welcome. Um, I chose the part to read that I did because I think it shows the aspects of why it probably got banned or why it was like up for being banned. So, yeah. You got the tags. The supply guy had a long face and his mouth twisted oddly when he... Is this, is this okay? Sorry. You got the tags. The supply guy had a long face, and his mouth twisted oddly when he spoke. How many bags you got there? There was a neat stack of dark bags on the shelf. Enough, he said, handing me the heavy plastic bag. What did he do, step on a mine? Yeah, that's what happens, he said. They sneak in and plant a mine on your path, and you don't know where the hell to walk. Oh, I took the bag out to where Simpson and Lieutenant Carroll waited. They lifted Jenkins by the shoulders of his uniform. Sergeant Simpsons used a first aid patch to pick up something that had erupted from the hellish wound on Jenkins' chest and fallen on the ground near him. He placed it in the bag on his side. I thought I would throw up. I stood along with the other guys in the squad until the bag had been zipped up. We started back to the hooch. On the way, I looked at, back at the body bag again. Sergeant Simpson and Lieutenant Carroll were talking together. The body bag was at their feet. I turned away and went to the hooch. Monaco came over and sat on the edge of my bunk. For a while, he didn't say anything. Then he put his hand on my shoulder. You know him? No, I said. I just met him at the replacement company. Sometimes it goes like that, Monaco said. He started to say something else, then shrugged it off and left. I wanted to say more to him. I wanted to say that the only dead person I had ever seen before had been my grandmother. I wanted to say that when I saw her, I was ready, walking into the darkened church with my family and sitting in the first pews. But Jenkins was different. Jenkins had been walking with me and talking with me only hours before, seeing him lying there like that, his mouth and eyes open, had grabbed something inside my chest and twisted it hard. The neat pile of body bags was waiting for the rest of us. There were enough there. The supply clerk had reached for the top one without even looking, to know that they expected that many of us would be going home in them. I didn't know what to think about what had happened. I didn't know what to feel. I touched my fingers to the palm of my hand. I could feel my fingers. It was only inside that I was numb. Lieutenant Carroll, our platoon leader, came in. He was a quiet guy with dark hair and dark, calm eyes and an uneasy smile. I never felt that he was comfortable with himself. I hadn't had a chance to talk with him yet. But sometimes I would see him drift off into his own daydreams and be embarrassed when we caught him at it. When the old guys, the guys had been... The guys that had been through it before saw him. They put their cards down in their magazines and gathered around him. I got up and nudged Pee Wee, who was lying face down on his bunk. Lieutenant Carroll took off his helmet and bowed his head. Lord, let us feel pity for Private Jenkins and sorrow for ourselves and all the angel warriors that fall. Let us fear death, but let it not live within us. Protect us, O Lord, and be merciful unto us. Amen. In the morning in the mess tent, I asked Lieutenant Carol, why he had called Jenkins an angel warrior. My father used to call all soldiers angel warriors, he said, because usually they get boys to fight wars. Most of you aren't even old enough to vote yet. How old are you? 23, he said. How come you're not retired? Lieutenant Carroll stayed in our hooch for a while and helped check our supplies. He asked if we were short or anything, and Monaco said we could use some more three days passes. I got a letter from Virginia Union, a brother we called Bruce, sat on a footlocker next to Lieutenant Carroll. His real name was Brewster, so I could see where Brew came from. They said I can probably get into theology school but there, but they can't accept me formally until six months before my admission date. Did you write to that school in New York I told you about, Lieutenant Carroll asked. No, Brew grinned. From what I've heard about New York, the, temp the temptations might be too great for me. 
If the temptations don't get you, then you got to look out for the Smokey Robinson and the miracles, Pee Wee called out. You know, Lieutenant Carroll had spread all the extra first aid packs on the floor in front of him. My brother went to theology school, and I almost followed him. You can still go, a guy from Wallowick said from his bunk. It's good for a priest to be older. I may have too many doubts now, Lieutenant Carroll said. If you turn to God, he'll take away your doubts, Bruce said. I don't have doubts about God, Lieutenant Carroll said. I'm not just sure who I am anymore. He gathered the first aid kits together and asked Brew if he would give them out. Then he got his weapon and said he would see us later. He don't look like a priest, Pee Wee said after Lieutenant Carroll had left. He used to act more like a holy guy or something when he first got over here. He never cursed or anything like that. Walwick was putting powder on a rash he had. Then, one day, we were trying to clear a road, and some guys got trapped in a ditch off to one side. We were on the other side of the road, and we could see them, but we couldn't get to them. It was getting dark, and we knew they couldn't last. Charlie was throwing everything at them. Then, Lieutenant Carroll just went wild and stormed across the fucking road. We went after him. We were shooting at guys maybe three or four feet from us. We finally wasted all of them and cleared the road. He hasn't been the same since, but we all found out what kind of guy he was that day. When the chips were down, he put his ass on the line for the guys. You get the guys out of the ditch okay, Pee Wee asked. Mm-hmm. Wallowick shook his head. That's why you guys are in the squad. I wrote Mama a letter all about how Jenkins had got killed. Then I tore it up and decided not to tell her about it. It would only get her upset. Instead, I told her more about Pee Wee. I didn't want to tell her about Jenkins for another reason, too. I didn't know how I felt about it. In a way, I was really sorry for Jenkins. But there was a small voice inside of me that was, wait, inside of me that kept saying that I was glad that it wasn't me that was killed. I didn't want anybody to see me putting that in a letter. They brought a VC into camp to question. They questioned him, and then they looked him, they took him into a hooch they used for storage while they decided what they were going to do with him. Pee Wee had been in there to get extra clips earlier and thought he might have lost his comb there. He went into the hooch to look for his pick, and the VC was sitting there and started a conversation with him. Sucker spoke better English than I did, Pee Wee said. What was he talking about, Brenner asked. Brenner had a thick neck and short blonde hair. He also seemed to have a chip on his shoulder. Asked me where I was from and stuff like that, Pee Wee said. I thought he was a friendly, you know. You tell him where you were from? Yeah, and he told me he used to go, to go to the flicks down on the same street and even asked me if I knew some chick named Thelma. Then what happened? Then he asked me for a cigarette and we was sitting there smoking when the, when the captain came in. That's when all hell broke loose. The fool jumped on me and tried to get my pistol and the captain ran up to him and punched him in the face. Then they had tied the VC up and threw him in the back of a jeep to take to an intelligence unit. And the captain gave Pee Wee hell for giving information to the enemy. Pee Wee said he was glad he'd give him some information. How come, Monaco said, cleaning his rifle again? Because if the cons ever get to the State Street, I want to be on their side, Pee Wee said. Wallowick, a Polish kid with dimples who looked like he had more teeth than he needed, looked up from his magazine, flashed a smile, and went back to reading. By the time we get out of here, there won't be any cons left, Brenner said. We'd get out of here a lot faster if we took them all to Hollywood. Lobel was tall and a little pudgy. His hair looked like his hair looked as if he had been giving himself a perm or something. He was almost as tall as me, but soft looking. He didn't look feminine or anything, just soft. What are you going to do with the Viet Cong in Hollywood? I asked. Look what they did after World War II, he said, getting up on one elbow. We made a hundred war movies, and we brought all the Germans over and gave them nice little bit parts, and they were very happy. We brought the Japanese over and gave them little bit parts, and they were happy. Now, all we have to do is to stop this silly war and start making the movies right away. We take all these little slant eyes over to the Universal, give them SAG cards, and put them to work. That is a fag solution, only capable of coming from the mind of a fag, Brenner said. Hey, Corporal, Lobel got up on one arm. Just because I don't have my serial number tattooed on my genitals does not mean I'm a fag. You wouldn't have enough room for more than three numbers anyway, Brenner said. He looked around to see who was laughing. Nobody was. We got the mail call and I didn't get anything. I had to find somebody to write to, write to beside Mama so I would get mail. I couldn't depend on Kenny to write. There was something happening up north the next morning. For about an hour, we heard artillery. Simpson was in our hooch talking about squirrel hunting outside of Petersburg, Virginia, and Monaco was getting on his case. You call that sport, Monaco asked? I mean, there you are. You gotta weigh 200 pounds, and you got a rifle, and you're against a squirrel that weighs maybe two or three pounds, and he ain't got nothing. 
Man, it's a damn sport, Simpson protested. You know what a sport is? Do I know what a sport is? Monaco pointed to himself. I played football and baseball for Marie's High School in Bayonne. I made all country. That's a sport. I don't have to shoot no little animals. You had you a rifle, Pee Wee said. You could have made all world. The way I figure it, Monaco went on, if you hunt a squirrel with the rifle, what do you hunt a bear with? Artillery? <laughs> Come in, some white... <laughs> Call in some white phosphorus on him, Bruce said. That'll get his attention until the jet zero in. White phosphorus, or Willie, or Willie Peter as they called it, was an artillery round that burned the crap out of anything it touched. You don't know nothing about no hunting, Simpson was getting pissed. You don't know what hunting is. What's he trying to say, Lobo was flat on his back. There was a can of coke on his chest. Is that white phosphorus is enough? After it burns the bear's ass off, then the, then the good sergeant will finish him off with a couple of frag grenades. L Lobo, you, you, you are a faggot. Surgeon, Surgeon Simpson got up and left the hooch. <laughs> that is it. Thank you. Ooh. Rebecca, why do you think that book was banned? Was <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of profanity, and it also shows like violence because it's like the wartime. So you are in high school, right? Yes. You, you ever hear profanity? Yes. Sometimes, right? Everywhere. Do you, I mean, do you feel that, that kids need to be protected from language in any way, shape, or form? What do you think? Um, no, because I feel as though that, that can't be possible because everywhere you're exposed to bad language. And um, like a lot of people curse in school. You hear it all the time. So I feel like bending it from books isn't going to change much. But how would we make it so that maybe kids wouldn't curse so much, so that maybe we'd, we'd have a dialogue amongst ourselves that that didn't need to necessarily use all the language that, that you just read in the book. What do you think? Um, that would have to be like a personal thing because they'd have to, it'd have to be like parents at home not cursing and just people there around. So that's like an environmental situation. A, a last thing for you. So that's a book about war. Yeah. Do you feel like you and the kids that you go to school with know anything about, about war and what it's like to mm. fight no. in a war? No. No. So that's probably a story that, that, that's informative to you in some way. It's a book about Vietnam, but it could be about Afghanistan. It could be about Iraq. Yeah. And it's, like, it's also the fact that the, um, the narrator, he's young, so it like gives us something to kind of relate to. It's like a coming-of-age story, and he goes in there, and he's seeing death and like war and stuff for the first time. So I feel like that's why I shouldn't be banned also. Thank you very much for reading. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll pass the microphone next door. Uh, Lorena Garay is a musician, and the book she's going to read from is How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents. Welcome. Oh, hi. Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, actually, I picked this patch passage because it doesn't contain any profane language. So <laughs> this is something nice. <laughs> Even after they'd been married, and had their own families and often couldn't make it for other occasions, the four daughters always came home for their father's birthday. They would gather together without husbands, would be husbands, or bring home work. For this too was part of the tradition. The daughters came home alone. The apartment was too small for everyone, the father argued. Surely their husbands could spare them for one overnight. The husbands could just as soon have not gone to their in-laws, but they felt annoyed at the father's trotting. Once he's going to realize you've grown up, you sleep with us. He's almost 70, for God's sake, the daughter said, defending the father. They were passionate women, but, they were devo but their devotions were like roots. They were sunk into the past towards the old man. So for one night every November, the daughters turned back into their father's girls. In the cramped living room, surrounded by the dark, oversized furniture from the old house they grew up in, they were children again in a smaller, simpler version of the world. There was the prodigal sin at the door. The father opened his arms wide and welcomed them in his broken English. This is your home, and never you should forget it. Inside, the mother fussed at them. Their sloppy clothes, their long, loose hair, their looking tired, too skinny, too made up, and so on. After a few glasses of wine, the father started in on what should be done if he did not live to see his next birthday. Come on, poppy, his daughters coaxed him, as if they were a modesty of his to perish 
and they had to talk him into staying alive. After his cakes and candles, the father distributed bulky envelopes that felt as if they were padded, and they were. No less than several hundreds in bills, tens and twenties and fives, all arranged to face the same way. The top one signed with the father's name, branding them his. Why not checks? The daughters would wonder later, <laughs> gossiping together in the bedroom, counting their money to make sure the father wasn't playing favorites. Was there some illegality that the father stashed such sums away? Was he? None of the daughters really believed this, but to contemplate it was a wonderful little explosion in their heads. Was he maybe dealing drugs or doing abortions in his office? At the table, there was always the pretense of trying to give the envelopes back. No, no, Papi, it's your birthday after all. The father told them there was plenty more where that had come from. The revolution in the old country had failed. Most of his comrades had been killed or bought off. He had escaped to this country. And now it was every man for himself. So what he made was for his girls. The father never gave his daughters money when their husbands were around. They might receive the wrong idea. The father once said, and although none of the daughters knew specifically what the father meant, they all understood what he was saying to them. Don't bring the man home for my birthday. <laughs> but this year, for his 70th birthday, the youngest daughter, Sophia, wanted a celebration at her house. Her son had been born that summer, and she did not want to be traveling in November with a four-month-old and her little girl. And yet she, of all the daughters, did not want to be the absent one because for the first time since she ran off with her husband six years ago, she and her father were on speaking terms. In fact, the old man had been out to see her, or really to see his grandson, twice. It was a big deal that Sophia had had a son. He was the first male born into the family in two generations. In fact, the baby was to be named for the grandfather, Carlos and his middle name was to be Sophia's maiden name. And so, what the old man had never hoped for with his harem of four girls, as he liked to joke, his own name was to be kept going in this new country. It's beautiful. What, is that book, what does that book mean to you? Well, this part was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Because sometimes we focus on the bad, and I think it's, we should give people a reason to read it. And then there are very nice passages that I feel very comfortable reading out yeah. loud. I, I, I think that the, uh, the, the quote that's actually in your program, that this idea that the author says, literature is about a human being and all of its complexity is important. That, that there's this idea that, that we can't just always have the nice passages, that they have to come with something dark too, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. No, and this, this is a part of, of, of everything that we do. It's, it's, it's art, it's music, it's everything. Exactly, yes. It's the whole package. It's the whole package. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm wondering if, if we might pass the microphone to, to Wally Lamb because I, I, I want to have a little conversation with him and with the rest of the panel a afterward about th this idea of, of why someone would reject literature um, based on language, perhaps based on content. Uh, Wally is going to uh, read from... Uh, an author with whom he's quite familiar. <laughs> <laughs> that would be myself. Uh, um, well, here's a little window into my weird life. Um, last month, uh, my first novel, which was published back in 1992, uh, was banned uh, by the Connecticut uh, Corrections Department. And um, last Saturday, just a couple of days ago, I was out in Seattle, Washington, for um, the premiere of uh, the stage play version of that same novel. Here's the, uh, this is the, the playbill from that. And I must say that, uh, that the, uh, uh, the playwright and the actors uh, did not shy away from um, some of the scenes that I guess were objectionable, at least for 24 hours, uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the corrections department. Uh, the book was banned um, at York Prison for Sexual Explicitness. Um, 
And uh, I was asked, well, what, what specifically did they mean? And I said, I have no idea because, you know, I, I had, you know, the, uh, DOC is not famous for communicating with one. Uh, and so, you know, there is, there is a, a lesbian sex scene um, in the book. Um, there is a heterosexual sex scene in the book. And there is a rape. Um, I, don't, I don't know what they, what they found objectionable. Um, Anyway, uh, in this scene that I've chosen to read, uh, the main character is uh, Dolores Price, who grows up in the course of the story. Here she is 17. Um, Dolores, four years earlier, uh, was raped by an upstairs tenant. And um, she has reacted. Her mother and her grandmother said, you know, don't tell anybody about this. You know, just pretend that it didn't happen. And uh, unable to do that quite, um, or perhaps trying to do that, uh, Dolores decided to um, uh, sequester herself pretty much, uh, cut a lot of school, and um, uh, stay in her bedroom watching a big new color TV that her mother had bought her to buy her silence. And um, the mother decides eventually that the one thing that is going to save Dolores, who is eating snack food like crazy and getting bigger and bigger and watching all this television. The, the one thing that is going to save her is college, going away to school, getting away. And so uh, in, a, in an uh, uncharacteristic act of bravery, her mother takes a steak knife out and she severs the cord um, to the television set and she says, I'll get this fixed when you go to the doctor and get the physical and have him sign the form that you need to go to college. So this is where we pick up. And this is uh, Dolores Price speaking. It took grandma to locate Dr. Finney, a tired old GP who my grandmother had been assured by her church cronies did little more than hold a stethoscope to you and tap your knee with a rubber mallet before signing whatever you wanted. None of that other monkey business, she whispered, looking away from me. On the eve of the appointment, she suggested timidly that I might like to wear a blouse and my nice navy skirt to the doctor's, but she said nothing when I came down the following morning in my sweatshirt and bell bottoms, armed with my cigarettes and a mug of Pepsi. Ma gassed and braked through downtown Providence, looking for Dr. Finney's building. She sang along with the radio, trying to act casual. It's clowns' illusions, I recall. It's clouds' illusions. I said it between clenched teeth. What? It's Cloud's Illusions, I recall. If you're going to sing it, then sing it right. I'm sorry, she said. She pulled abruptly to the curb and jerked the brake. We both bucked forward and Pepsi lapped out onto my jeans. I'm sorry again, she said. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Here's the building. The pinka pinka of the directional signal got louder, and we both waited to see what I would do. I considered running down a side street and not calling her until I was 40 years old and she was on her deathbed. But I had already missed a crucial murder on Guiding Light, not to mention Betty Jo's wedding on Petticoat Junction. She hadn't bought me a new paperback in three weeks. It was like starving. The rickety elevator smelled like urine. Though we were its only passengers, it stopped on each floor, opening its doors to no one while we waited rigidly. As it reached Dr. Finney's floor, I turned to my mother. You know, you must really hate me, I said. Her hand was, sh was shaking, crinkling the form that the college had sent. I don't hate you, she said. Yeah, but deep down you must, or else he wouldn't be doing this to me. I love you, she said, just loud enough to for me to hear. Yeah, bull crap, I said. The walls of the examining room were the color of mustard. Above a drippy sink hung a drugstore calendar, two Technicolor Cocker Spaniels in a wicker basket. To the left of the examination table was a wastebasket, empty except for a single blood-stained gauze pad. I took off my sandals and my jeans, and I pulled the sweatshirt over my head. I was still wearing my bra and a t-shirt and a pair of underpants that was going to stay on no matter what. That old pervert could look at his other female patients if anyone else was stupid enough to show up here. They couldn't make me go to college. They couldn't drag me there. All I wanted was to get my TV shows back. The gown rustled and crinkled as I fumbled with the paper tabs at the back of the neck. 
I tried molding the paper to myself, but it fanned out stubbornly like a giant bib. In the outer office, Ma and the doctor were mumbling. I sat up on the table and fished out a cigarette to calm my nerves. I smoked it fast, watching the ash tumble down the tunnels of the stiff gown. He was scanning the form when he came into the room. He stood before me, reading. Look, I said, I'm not taking anything else off. I was addressing the Cocker Spaniels. When I looked back at him, he was staring directly at me. You are too goddamn fat, he said. I took a defiant drag on my cigarette and willed myself not to cry. The remark made me dizzy. For the past four years, my mother and grandmother had played by the rule, never mentioned my weight. And now my jeans and sweatshirt were folded in a helpless pile beside me, and there was only a thin sheet of paper between me and this despicable old man. My heart raced with fear and nicotine and Pepsi. My whole body dripped sweat. Any trouble with your period? No. What? No trouble, I said louder. He nodded in the direction of his stand-up scale. The backs of my legs made little sucking sounds as they unglued themselves from the plastic upholstery. He brought the sliding metal bar down tight against my scalp, and he fiddled with the cylinder in front of my face. Five, five and a half, he said. 257. The tears leaking from my eyes made stains on the paper gown. I nodded or shook my head abruptly at each of his questions about diet, smoking, heart murmur. He signed the form. At the door, his hand on the knob, he turned back and waited until I met his eye. Let me tell you something, he said. My wife died four Tuesdays ago, cancer of the colon. We were married for 41 years. Now I want you to stop feeling sorry for yourself and lose some of that pork of yours. Pretty girl like you, you don't want to do this to yourself. Eat shit, I said. <laughs> I guess I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> that that book is not the only book that that was banned at York at this at around the same time, right? There, there was a controversy around another book that you that you worked on. Uh, yes, ironically enough, um, this this was the book that was officially banned, but on the endangered list um, was a book called um, uh, "I'll Fly Away," and um, that was pending a banning. And um, that book had been written by the women at York Prison who were in the writing program that I've maintained for about 14 years. And, um, and that book had been uh, vetted and approved by, um, by corrections. So I didn't, I didn't understand why they were suddenly uh, going to disallow it and have it taken off the shelf. When you say vetted and approved by corrections, what do you suppose that means? What, what, what sort of room do they go in and read books? <laughs> well, um, as, with, as with both of the books um, that I did with the women, um, I submitted the manuscript uh, in advance. And um, with the first book, couldn't keep it to myself, the one um, where there was a lawsuit involved, um, the um, DOC reported to the Hartford Current, and the, report, and the Hartford Current put it in the paper that um, this had been uh, a sneak project and that um, they didn't know anything about it, but they, in, in, in actuality, had the manuscript months before the book came out. Um, with the second book, after the lawsuit was settled, um, I, again, submitted the manuscript of the women's work and, uh, and, I, and then I sat with the deputy warden at the time, and she talked about the things that needed to come out, uh, she said, for reasons of safety and security. And um, it, was thing, it was things like, if there is a code green, you know, they didn't, they didn't want it revealed, you know, what some of these signals were. Um, and I thought that was, that was fine and reasonable. And so I, you know, so I took, I took the stuff out that they objected to, and uh, the book went forward with no trouble, that second book. Um, and so, that, you know, that's, you know, this, these are, these, I work with women um, who have been told to shut their fucking mouths, excuse my language, um, uh, all their lives, you know, uh, be quiet or, or you'll, you know, my fist is going to meet your mouth, that kind of thing. Um, so I didn't understand why suddenly this book was a threat to these women. 
Um, so um, it was confusing to me. It's, it's confusing to a lot of us. And thank you again for sharing the story. It's just always remarkable whenever I, I, I hear the redemptive power that this has had in so many women's lives, this work that you've done, and the other artists who've gone and worked at York. It's some amazing stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a therapist by a long shot, but I am witnessing the therapeutic, therapeutic uh, effect of they're not only writing their stories, um, but then sharing them with uh, one another uh, in, the, in the workshop discussions. And then, um, and then eventually, for those who want to do it, um, you know, sending it out into the world uh, in print. If you don't mind passing the microphone next door to your neighbor, um, Kathy Malloy is the Executive Director of the Greater Hartford Arts Council. She's also, also the First Lady of the State of Connecticut, and she's going to be reading from Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Welcome. Hi. Um, actually, you know, listening to Wally um, speak, I have, um, prior to coming up um, to Hartford and uh, taking the position at the Arts Council, I was the CEO of a uh, rape crisis center for 11 years and um, continued to do my work in victim advocacy, uh, which I have a uh, passion for. And um, just by circumstance, the Greater Hartford Arts Council supports two very significant programs in the prison system. One is the Judy Joran Performance Project, which does an incredible amount of work at York, and I've had the pleasure and honor to um, go to York many times and meet the inmates. And uh, these women are um, fantastic. Um, this kind of stuff is kind of comical because, as Bali said, they've heard much worse than this. <laughs> um, and they've lived very tough lives, and, uh, and, uh, uh, which is true. In the, um, we also support a program called Prison Arts and how important the arts are to um, help these individuals um, get some self-esteem, uh, take their minds off what's happening in the prison. And um, whether you like the idea of it or believe in the idea of it, uh, most of these people are coming and they're re-entering society. And it's critical that we support them, we work with them, and we make sure that when they come out, that uh, they can live uh, lives, uh, good lives, and uh, they're people and human beings that deserve a chance. And uh, thank you so much for the work that you do with them because um, they, they really are, are incredible. And they, don't let, they wouldn't let a big gang like this come into the prison, believe me. <laughs> if they're banning <laughs> books, uh, they're not going to let a big group come in. But um, it's really amazing. Uh, Judy Dwarren does a project called uh, Dance. She does spoken word, dance, and journaling which is just remarkable. Judy, so, and, Judy and I have uh, collaborated yeah. on a couple of projects, and, uh, and they, were, they were just fantastic, yeah. the, the final products. Yeah, so um, my book was The Color Purple, um, which was um, kind of ironic, uh, being that I've spent a good part of my life working with victims of sexual violence and child sexual abuse. And uh, this book uh, not only talks about racism, but about uh, sexual assault. Um, it is about two sisters that are communicating. We have lost touch with each other. Um, so the first sister, and most part of, almost 95% of the book, is writing, um, she writes, Dear God, um, but actually that doesn't have any uh, real uh, religious significance. It's just uh, how she is writing. Um, and then in the end, they, uh, she and her sister connect in the end, so this is um, a letter from her to her, to, it's letters that they've written to each other. Dear Silly, Silly, I don't know how to pronounce that. Silly, Silly. After two and a half months, Adam and Tashi returned. Adam, Adam overtook Tashi and her mother and some other members of our compound as they were nearing the village where the white woman missionary had lived. But Tashi would not hear of turning back, nor would Catherine. And so Adam accompanied them to the, how do you pronounce that? Beles? Yeah, your guess is Okay. Good uh, I'll just say the encampment. I'll edit. <laughs> I'll censor the book. Uh, to, the <laughs> to the encampment. Oh, he says, it is the most extraordinary place. 
You know, Sally, Sally, in Africa, there is a huge depression in the earth called the Great, Great Rift Valley, but it is, it is on the other side of the continent from where we are. However, according to Adam, there is a small rift on our side, several thousand acres large and even deeper than the Great Rift, which covers millions of acres. It is a place set so deep into the earth that it can only really be seen, Adam thinks, from the air, and that it would seem just an overgrown canyon. Well, in this overgrown canyon are a thousand people from dozens of African tribes, and even one colored man, Adam swears, from Alabama. There are farms, there is a school, an infirmary, a temple, and there are male and female warriors who do indeed go on missions of sabotage against the white plantations. But all this seemed more a marvel in, a re in the recounting than in the actual experiencing of it. If I am any judge of Adam and Tashi, their minds seem to have been completely riveted on each other. I wish you could have seen them as they staggered into the compound, filthy as hogs, hair as wild as could be, sleepy, exhausted, smelly, God knows, but still arguing. Just because I came back with you, don't think I'm saying yes to marriage, Tash, says Tashi. Oh, yes, you are, says Adam, heatedly, but through a yawn, but through a yawn. You promised your mother. I promised your mother. Nobody in America will like me, says Tashi. I will like you, says Adam. Olivia ran and enfolded Tashi in her, in her arms, ran about preparing food and a bath. Last night, after Tashi and Adam had slept most of the day, we had a family conference. We informed them that because so many of our people had gone to join them in the encampment, I edited that, and the planters were beginning to bring in Muslim workers from the north. And because it was time for us to do so, we would be leaving for home in a matter of weeks. Adam announced his desire to marry Tashi. Tashi announced her refusal to be married. And then, in that honest, forthright way of hers, she gave her reasons. Paramount among them that, because of the scarif scarification marks on her cheeks, Americans will look down on her as a savage and shun her, and whatever children she and Adam might have that she had seen the magazines we received from home and that it was very clear to her that black people did not truly admire black-skinned black people like herself and especially did not admire black-skinned black women. They bleach their faces, she said. They fry their hair. They try to look naked. Also, she continued, I fear Adam will be distracted by one of those naked-looking women and desert me. Then I would have no country, no people, no mother, and no husband and brother. You have a sister, said Olivia. Then Adam spoke. He said he asked Tashi to forgive his initial stupid response to the scarification and to forgive the repugnance he'd felt about the female initiation ceremony. He assured Tashi that, that, it was he, that it was she he loved, and that in America, she would have country, people, parents, sister, husband, brother, and lover, and that whatever befell her in America would also be his own choice and his own lot. Oh, Sally, Sally, Oh, Seely, so the next day our boy came to us with scars identical to Tashi's on his cheeks. And they are so happy, so happy, Seely, Tashi and Adam, Oma Tangu. Samuel married them, of course, and all the people left in the compound came to wish them happiness and an abundance of roof, le roof leaf forever. Olivia stood up with the bride and a friend of Adam's a man too old to have joined the encampment, stood up with him. 
Immediately after the wedding, we left the compound, riding in a lorry that took us to a boat at the coast inlet that flows out to sea. In a few weeks, we will be home. Your loving sister, Nettie. Dear Nettie, Mr. Now, why did they do those blanks there? Um, she calls him Mr. As a okay, okay. Okay, so dear, dear Nettie, Mr. Talk to Shug a lot lately by telephone. He say as soon as he told her my sister and her family was missing, she and Jermaine made a beeline for the State, Depart State Department trying to find out what happened. He say, Shug, just say it, just kill her, and to think I'm down here suffering from not knowing. But nothing happened at the State Department, nothing at the, at the Department of Defense. It's a big war. So much going on. One ship lost feel like nothing, I guess. Plus, colored don't count to those people. Well, they just don't know and never did, never will. And so what? I know you on your way home and you may not get here until I'm 90. But one of those days, I do expect to see your face. Meanwhile, I hired Sophia to clerk in our store kept the white man, Alfonso, got to run it, but put Sophia in there to wait on colored because they never had nobody in a store to wait on before and nobody in a store to treat them nice. Sophia real good at selling stuff to, to cause. She act like she don't care if you buy or not. No skin off her nose. And then if you decide to buy anyhow, well, she might exchange a few pleasant words with you. Plus, she scared the white man. Anybody else colored, he tried to call him auntie or something. First time he tried that was Sophia. She asked him which colored man his mama's sister marry. I asked Harpo, do we mind if Sophia work? What am I going to mind for, he say. It seemed to make her happy. And I can take care of anything come up at home. Anyhow, he say. Sophia got me a little help for when Henrietta needs something special to eat or get sick. Yes, yeah, said Sophia, Miss Eleanor Jane got look in on her Henrietta and every other day promised to cook her something she'll eat. You know, white people have a look of machinery in their kitchen, a lot of machinery in their kitchen. She whip up stuff with yams you never believe. Last week she went and made yam ice cream. How this happened, I asked. I thought the two of you was through. Oh, say Sophia, it finally dawned on her to ask her mama why I can come back to work for them. I don't expect it to last, though, say Harpo. You know how they is. Do her peoples know, I asked. They say, they know, um, they know say Sophia. They carry on just like you know they would. Whoever heard of a white woman working for niggers? They rave. She tell them, whoever heard of somebody like Sophia working for trash? She bring Reynolds Stanley with her, I asked. Henri Henrietta say she don't mind him. Well, say Harpo, I'm satisfi satisfied if her men folks against her helping you, she, got, she gonna quit. Let her quit, say, say Sophia. It's not my salvation she's, she's working for. And if she don't learn, she got to face judgment for herself. She won't even have, li have life live. Well, you got, you got me behind you anyway, say Harpo. And I loves every judgment you ever made. He move up and kiss her where her nose was stitched. Sophia tossed her head. Everybody learned something in life, she say, and they laugh. Speaking of learning... Mr. Say, only one day us was sewing out on the porch. I first start to learn all them days ago. I used to sit up there on my porch, staring across the railing. Just miserable. That's what I was. And I couldn't understand why us live a life at all. If it can do most times, it make you feel so bad. All I ever wanted in life was Shug Avery, he say. And one one while, all she wanted in life was me. Well, us couldn't have each other, he say. I got Anna, Annie Julia, then you. 
all of them rotten children. She got Grady and who know who, who all, but still look like some come out better than me. A lot of people sh love Shug, but nobody but Shug love me. Hard not to love Shug, I say. She know how to love somebody back. I tried to do something about children after you left me, but by that time it was too late. Bub came with me for two weeks, stole all my money, laid up on the porch drunk. My girl so far off into men's and religion they can hardly talk. Every time they open their mouths, some kind of plea come out. Near about broke my sorry heart. If you know your heart sorry, I say, that, that mean it not quite as spoiled as you think. Anyhow, he say, you know how it is, you asked yourself one question, it lead to 15. I start to wonder why us need love, why us suffer, why us black, why us men and women. Where do children really come from? It didn't take long to realize I didn't hardly know nothing. And that is if you asked yourself, why you black? Or a man, or a woman, or a bush? It don't mean nothing if you don't ask why you here, period. So what do you think, I asked. I think us here to wonder, myself, to wonder, to ask. And that in the wondering about the big things and asking about the big things, you learn about the little ones almost by accident. But you never know nothing more than the big things that you start out with. The more I wonder, you say, the more I love. And people start to love you back, I bet, I say. They do, he say, surprise. Harper seemed to love me, Sophia and the children, I think even old, evil Henrietta loved me a little bit, but that's because she know she's just a big mystery to me as the man in the moon. Mister is busy patterning a shirt for folks to wear with my pants. Got to have pockets, he say. Got to have loose sleeves. And definitely, you're not supposed to wear it with no tie. Folks wearing ties look like they be in lynch. And then, just when I know I can live content without Chug, just when Mr. Dunn asked me to marry him again, this time in spirit as well as in the flesh, and just if I say, nah, I still don't like frogs, but let us be friends, Chug writes me, she coming home. Now, is this life or not? I be so calm. If she come, I be happy. If she don't, I'd be content. And then I figured this is the lesson I was supposed to learn. Oh, Seely, she say, stepping out of the car, dressed like a movie star, I miss you more than I miss my own mama. Us hug. Come in on. Come on in, I say. Oh, the house looks so nice, she say, when us get to her room. You know, I love pink. Got you some elephants and turtles coming too, I say. Where are you room, she asked. Down the hall, I say. Let's go see it, she say. Well, here it is, I say, standing in the door. Everything in my room purple and red except the floor that painted bright yellow. She go right to the little purple frog perch on my mantelpiece. What's this, she asked. Oh, I say, a little something Albert carved for me. She look at me funny for a minute. I look at her. Then us laugh. Where's, where's Jermaine at, I asked. In college, she say, Wilberforce. Can't let all the talent go to waste. Us through, through and through, she say, he feel just like family now, like a son, maybe a grandson. What you and Albert been up to, she asked. Nothing much, I say. She say, I know Albert, and I, been, I bet he up, up to something with you looking as fine as you look. Ah, so, I say, make idle conversation. How idle, she asks. What do, you, what do you know, I think? Shug jealous? I have a good mind to make up a story just to make her feel bad, but I don't. Us talk about you, I say. How much us, us love you? She smile, come put her head on my breast, 
let out a long breath. Your sister, Celie. <laughs> Thank you. There's a beautiful quote in there, the more I wonder, the more I love. It's, sort of, it's the sort of thing you write down. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if you could pass the microphone next door, because I'd like to save some time for some questions from our audience. And Wilfredo Nieves is here. He's president of Capital Community College to read from the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to spend some time with the community. Uh, wonderful book. Um, resonated with me personally growing up. Uh, it, it tells a story of a Native American Indian young man um, as a teenager uh, finding himself leaving the reservation to go to school for a better education. So I think it, it really resonates for what I do. Uh, the part I like to read, uh, grandmother gives me some advice. It, it also reminded me of my grandmother and it was very special. Okay. I went home that night completely confused and terrified. If I'd punched an Indian in the face, then he would have spent days plotting his revenge. And I imagined that white guys would also want revenge after getting punched in the face. So I figured Roger was going to run me over with a farm tractor or combine or a grain truck or a runaway pig. I wish Rowdy was still my friend. I could have sent him after Roger. It would have been like King Kong battling Godzilla. I realized how much of my self-worth, my sense of safety, was based on Rowdy's fist. But Rowdy hated me, and Roger hated me. I was good at being hated by guys who could kick my ass. It's not a talent you really want to have. My mother and father weren't home, so I turned to my grandmother for advice. Grandma, I said, I punched this big guy in the face, and he just walked away. And now I'm afraid he's going to kill me. Why did you punch him, she asked. He was bullying me. You should have just walked away. He called me chief and squaw boy. Then you should have kicked him in the balls. <laughs> she pretended to kick a big guy in the crotch, and we both laughed. Did he hit you, she asked. No, not at all, I said. Not even after you hit him? Nope. He's a big guy, gigantic. I bet he could take Rowdy down. Wow, she said. It's strange, isn't it, I asked. What does it mean? Grandma thought for a while. I think it means he respects you. She said, respect you? No way. Yes way. You see, young, you, young men and boys are like packs of wild dogs. This giant boy is the alpha male of the school, and you're the new dog, so he pushed you around a bit to see how tough you are. But I'm not tough at all, I said. Yeah, but you punched the alpha dog in the face, she said. They're going to respect you now. I love you, Grandma, I said, but you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go a couple of pages up to the part where he now is confronted by Roger. And then I saw Roger walk out the front door. Man, I was going to have to fight. Shit, my whole life is a, is a fight. Hey, Roger said, hey, I said, who was that on the bike, he asked. Oh, that was my dad's best friend. That was a cool bike, he said, vintage. Yeah, he just got it. You ride with him a lot? Yes, I said. I lied. Cool, Roger said. Yeah, cool, I said. All right, then, he said. I'll see you around. And then he walked away. Wow, he didn't kick my ass. He was actually nice. He paid me some respect. He paid respect to Eugene and his bike. Maybe Grandma was right. Maybe I had challenged the alpha dog and was now being rewarded for it. I love my grandmother. She's the smartest person on the planet. Feeling almost like a human being, I walked into school and saw Penelope the Beautiful. Hey, Penelope, I said, hoping she knew I was now accepted by the dog pack. She didn't even respond to me. Maybe she hadn't heard me. Hey, Penelope, I said again. She looked at me and sniffed. She sniffed like I smelled bad or something. Do I know you, she said. There were only about 100 students in the whole school, right? So of course she knew me. She was just being a bitch. <laughs> I'm Junior, I said. I mean, I'm Arnold. Oh, that's right, she said. You're the boy who can't figure out his own name. Her friends giggled. I was so ashamed. I might have impressed the king, but the queen still hated me. I guess my grandmother didn't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Talk to us for a minute more about how, how you feel that informs the work you do today, that book. Well, I, I find so many young people, and not so young people, who um, are not connected to an environment or to people. And they see the college, and even though our college, Capital Community College, is an accessible place and it's downtown and, and has familiar familiarity uh, for people, it still can be overwhelming and intimidating, just the structure and having to fill out some of the forms that we have to, for people. And, and so when someone who's going into a new environment, who doesn't know anybody, um, comes through the door, and as much as we think it's a welcoming environment, those of us who are there every day, it isn't necessarily that kind of place. So I felt for uh, Arnold Jr. as he tried to find his place, knowing that he was going here to better himself, to have a better opportunity for education. So, so certainly I, I think that I see so many of our students, and, and um, so many of our students are first, gener first person in their family, first generation to go to college. Uh, it is intimidating, and it can be very scary. And that's one of the things that I hear over and over again about community colleges, that they make this safe and accessible space for people who have never experienced this before. That, that's, that's an important step for many people's lives. We've gone as far as to create a welcome center with that specifically in mind. And, and we staff it with people who uh, are friendly, uh, smiling, uh, warm. Uh, and, and certainly because um, our college is one that is, uh, embraces diversity. We're the most diverse college in the state, one of the most, and certainly in, in New England and in the country. So, so it is a place, um, once you get there, you, you see yourself reflected in the people, the other students. There is a sense of comfort. And then because people reach out to you, it, it's a very special place. Thank you very much, sir. I pass the microphone along to our last reader, uh, another friend from the world of media. He's a television host and an educator, and he's written a column for many years for the Hartford Current, and he's done a radio show, and he's here to read from what I understand is your autobiography, <laughs> Captain Underpants. Stan Captain Simpson. Underpants. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. I, I do confess to being surprised. I heard they're going to have a reading here, a provocative, salacious, highly inappropriate book, so <laughs> I was all in. But I figured for sure I would get Fifty Shades of Grey because <laughs> I knew if I had that book, all the women would be wrapped attention and most of the men. But I do have Captain Underpants. This is the tale of George and Harold, and they've created this superhero called Captain Underpants, whose uh, alter ego is, is Mr. Krupp. And I guess they've, uh, the author, Dave Pilkey, has written a series here, and this particular one is Captain Underpants and the revolting revenge and the, of the radioactive robo-boxers. So I'll read you a few passages. Also, one quick thing, too, uh, dovetailing on uh, Wally and the First Lady's comments on the prison. If you look at the prison system for the men, 75% of the Connecticut inmates do not have a high school diploma. And so I believe the achievement gap and the prison situation tie in hand in hand. So when you talk about banning books from prisoners, who for the most part are functionally illiterate, you're contributing to the problem. Chapter two, did you ever notice how grown-ups hate it when kids are having fun? Seriously, when was the last time you were doing something fun and some adult came over and made you stop? If you're like most kids, you probably, you're probably reading this book because some adult wanted you to quit playing video games or watching TV. If you don't believe me, try this experiment. Grab a few of your friends, go into the corner of a room and start goofing around. Make some noise, start laughing and cheering, and maybe shout out a woohoo or two. It's been scientifically proven that 89.4% of all grown-ups will drop whatever they're doing, rush over, and put a stop to whatever nonsense you're up to. <laughs> you have to wonder, why are most grown-ups like this? Weren't they ever kids themselves? Do they really enjoy laughing and cheering, or didn't they really enjoy laughing and goofing around when they were young? If so, when did they stop, and why? Now, I certainly can't speak for all adults, but I'm going to anyways. I think it's a lot easier for adults to stomp out someone else's fun than it is for them to reflect on their own lives and figure out where it all went so miserably wrong. <laughs> it's just too depressing for grown-ups to ponder all the decades of compromises, failures, laziness, fear, and regrettable choices that slowly transformed them from running, jumping, laughing, fun-loving kids into grumpy, complaining, calorie-counting, 
easily offended, peace and quiet demanding grouches. In other words, it's harder to look within yourself than it is to shout out, hey you kids, cut that out. Keep, keep this in mind, you might not want to smile or laugh while reading this book. And when you get to the fliporama parts, I suggest you flip with a bored, disinterested look on your face, or some adult will probably take this book away from you and make you read Sarah plain and tall instead. <laughs> Don't say I didn't warn you. Chapter three. Tippy Tinkle Trousers was in big trouble. He had zapped himself back in time five years and accidentally frightened four bullies. This thoughtless mistake set in motion a series of events that ultimately got Mr. Crump fired. And since there was no Mr. Crump, there was no Captain Underpants. And since there was no Captain Underpants, there was nobody to save the world from the terrible devastation caused by the villains from our, three, from our first three epic novels. Tippy decided there was only one thing to do, go back in time and stop himself from scaring those bullies. But in order to do this, he would have to go back in time before the last time he had gone back in time. So Tippy set his tinkle time travel meter for 10 minutes before the last time he had arrived in the past and pressed the away we go button. After several seconds of made for television style special effects, Tippy found himself transported to the awful night of the terrifying thunderstorm. Everything looked very familiar. He knew at any moment the four bullies would come running from the school and tear across the football field. Then they would come face to face with him, well, a slightly younger version of him, and only he could stop it all from happening. Tippy hit behind the, the side of the school and waited for the wind, and waited as the wind howled ferociously. Suddenly, a brilliant flash of lightning struck a nearby power line. The electricity in the school went out, and all the windows became dark. Tippy listened closely and heard the sounds of squealing and slapping and shuffling. It sounded as if a terrible struggle was taking place inside the school. Then suddenly, the back door of the school crashed open, and the four petrified bullies shoved their way outside. Quickly, they darted toward the football field. This was Tippy's big chance. He aimed his freezy beam 4,000 at the running delinquents and zapped them all with a mini mountain of molecularly modified ice. The four bullies were frozen in place. Tippy scanned the boys with his life systems monitor and found them to be perfectly preserved. The carbonite and Tabana gas-infused ice had been programmed to remain solid for 15 minutes, just long enough for Tippy to do his thing. Quickly, Tippy turned toward the football field, where a ball of blue lightning was growing bigger and bigger. Suddenly, it exploded in a blinding flash, and there was a ball of lightning uh, and a giant pair of robotic pants. Boy, that was a close one, said a voice from inside the depths of the newly arrived Robo Pants. Captain Underpants is a lot stronger than I thought. The zipper of the new arrived robotic trousers opened, and a tiny man peeked out to marvel at the world of five years ago. But to his surprise, he saw an identical copy of himself staring straight at him and tapping his gigantic robotic foot impatiently. Who are you? asked the newly arrived Tippy. I'm you, shouted future Tippy. You from the future. What's going on? asked Tippy. I'm here to stop you from scaring those kids over there, said future Tippy, pointing to the frozen bullies. Why, said Tippy. What's so important about those kids? I have no idea, said future Tippy. All I know is I scared those kids when I came back here last time, and apparently it caused a chain reaction that resulted in the total destruction of Earth, more or less. <laughs> I see, t said Tippy. So what do we do now? Future Tippy looked at his watch. Those kids are going to thaw out in 8 minutes and 11 seconds, he said. We've got to be gone by then. So he reached into the cockpit of his robo pants and grabbed one of his very first inventions, the Shrinky Pig 2000. Tippy aimed it at the younger version of himself and pressed the button. Blitz! A powerful beam of uh, energy blasted the newly arrived Tippy Tinkle Trousers and his gigantic pair of robo pants and shrunk them down to the size of a baseball. Big Tippy reached down and picked up the tiny version of himself. What did you do that for, he shouted. I can't very well have two of us running around, said Big Tippy. I've got to keep an eye on you. Big Tippy tucked Tiny Tippy into his jacket pocket and checked his watch again. Four minutes and 16 seconds, he muttered to himself. 
He looked over at the four bullies encased in the now cracking ice mound. Big Tippy turned to his tinkle time travel meter and programmed it for a date in the future. Time was running out. The ice around the bullies was disintegrating fast. So Tippy sneaked away to the center of the town, pressed his away we go button, and disappeared into a ball of blue lightning. Two seconds later, the ice mountain that had encased and preserved the bullies disintegrated completely. Without skipping a beat, the four frightened friends continued their mad dash away from the school. As they ran across the football field toward their homes, something about Kipper and his friends changed forever. They would never again be the same despicable bullies they once were. I'll end it there. Since it's <laughs> Thank you. We're almost out of time, and I, I thought I would open it up in case anybody has any questions or, or comments for our panel. Just raise your hand. I'd love to get you a microphone. I'm sure someone in this well-read audience has something you want to share with our, with our panelists. Anybody? Anybody? Hi. I'm going to fill Donahue. <laughs> Um, I'm in the middle of reading um, Orange is the New Black, and I thought of, I, I can't stop thinking about Wally Lamb every time, every page. And I think what's so incredible to me is the work you're doing, the work you've done, and the suffering that women and men experience in our prisons in Connecticut and throughout the country. It's so horrific that um, I listen to you and I feel some hope because as I'm reading this book, it's very, very distressful. Distressing, is that right? Um, but I thought that this was very, very good and I, and I love that ACLU and um, the other organizations pulled us together. So I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say to Wally, whatever you do and, and, and all the work you're doing for all of these people in prisons is so critical. And of course, how could anybody think of banning those books? I mean, it was absurd. So thank you. Thank you. Will you accept an, an affirming statement in lieu of a question? Yes. I will. And I also wanted to mention, and I hadn't before. That's okay. I don't need the mic. I, I used to be a high school teacher. I can yell if I need to. <laughs> um, but I, I, I did want to mention that, um, yeah, that, the, that the ban for She's Come Undone was turned around in about 24 hours um, because um, one of the people I, 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 uh, I mentioned it on my Facebook post. And uh, one of the people who read it uh, was uh, Mike Lawler, who is with the uh, Governor Malloy's administration. Um, and a, a combination of, lot of hundreds of responses um, and his uh, seeing to it um, that you know, the ban was, was lifted. Um, somebody, <laughs> uh, another librarian, emailed me and said, um, that was the fastest turnaround in the state of Connecticut. <laughs> It was it, the social media has gotten so powerful, uh, and it can be used for good and for not so good. As well. When I was uh, at the high school uh, teaching, uh, we had a, uh, you know, occasionally we would have a parent who would complain about language or a sexual situation or something like that. And so we, a form 
if you wanted to lodge a complaint, um, you could. But the form uh, was, I think, 10, 12 pages, something like that, <laughs> and required you to read the entire book, not just the, the page that was uh, objectionable. Uh, and uh, you, would, you, would not, you would not believe how many people sort of put their objection aside rather than read the book and fill out the form. <laughs> As a parent, I think I'm a bit of a hypocrite. As a parent of two kids, including a 13-year-old daughter, I'm pretty much a prude when it comes to books and movies and music. And I'm the guy where she's in the car and 937 is on, turn it off. And if HBO is on and want to shield it, you realize by age 11, they learn all the things you're afraid to sh keep them away from. They hear it on the bus, in the bathroom, in the school. So on one hand, as a father, I appreciate the censorship. On the other hand, you hear how absurd it is to censor these things. These kids know, hear these languages or these words anyway. So um, I do admit to being a bit uh, you know, you know, mixed on that, because I have been very much prudent with my daughter as far as what she can see, read, but she's informed me. She's heard all these words, she knows all these things, so I've kind of had to back off that. Well, that's sort of thing. Rebellion, I mean, I mean, I think the, the fear of rebellion is a common thread through these books. So I think you have a very good point there. Censorship, I think, is motivated by, by fear, ignorance, and good intentions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, some combination, yeah. some combination thereof. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, in fact, in state government this year, there were a lot of uh, were a lot of proposed laws, most of which failed to limit access to information. And it, 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 there's a battle all the time. You know, the hard to make it hard to get harder to get police records. And, uh, Nine one the nine one one calls from Newtown and you know this and it, it, it is a battle but I mean I I, I want to err on the side of of, <coughs> of openness of transparency the the, side, the lifeblood of society is the, is the transfer of information and to inhibit it is to it, you know it, it is to limit the, the the flow of ideas that are that are out there and. Uh, you know, barring a you know, what is called in the law a clear and present danger, um, yes, I want the information out there, and I and I want and I want to without a very you know I don't, maybe not um, you know maybe we can inhibit uh, you know, books about making bombs with sarin gas or something like you know something like that, but but, but uh, simple ideas, I mean. Is there, a, is, is there a greater irony than 
penning a book that warns about the dangers of totalitarianism? Yeah. <laughs> there it is. No. Thank you very much. Just, just as the last thing, because we're out of time, Wally, can you go and see? Can you show them on your shirt? The T-shirt that uh, you're wearing. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, band, uh, you know, read band books, it says. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I thought of it is it's just Thomas saying that we're just in the middle of doing a Freedom of Information Act request for radio station. We got some copies back of some documents that we assumed were available to us, and they came back with pages that looked just like that, redacted, 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 redacted. And it's amazing how much of the world is, is indeed redacted. And so I'm really, I'm very, very glad once again for a second year uh, to join with you and, and hear some of this great literature. Uh, a nice round of applause for our readers.